Hello, my friends. Hello, my life warriors, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the Day In, Day Out podcast. Woo! Today on episode 306, it's the welcome return of Minter Dial. He is a keynote speaker, author, a podcaster, a award-winning author. Uh, when I say author, award-winning author. And yeah, general deadhead and slacker. Dare I say. <laughs> Minter, welcome back. Welcome back. I love the energy. Yeah, I'm a slacker sitting on my bum, <laughs> having having a smile on this fun Sunday with you. Uh Yes, like you know, like this is the thing. Last time we spoke was back in 2021, and yeah, it was fun then. And like you have been quite busy since we last spoke because you have releasing, uh, yeah, Heart Official Empathy, second edition of your book. What brought this on? Why? Well, first of all, thanks for having me back on the show, really oh. fun, and um. I think basically before I get into the specifics, I feel this has been a very creative period for me. The The amount of change that's happening is uh, very stimulating for me as I regard what's going on in society, mm -hmm. the kinds of commentaries you're getting, even at dinner parties online, uh, how the politicians are trying to deal with it, how a lot of business owners are trying to deal with it. And it, it felt really you know, almost obvious when the the world was hit by this new thing called chat gpt <laughs> I'd, i've been i've been tracking what had been happening and uh, I, I started to write about i wanted to update because you know a lot of things have been happening in ai mm. simultaneously a lot of things have been happening around mental health so you saw coming out of covid a, a lot of of individuals typically 18 to 24 the worst hit suffering from mental health and and two my two children are roughly in that age and they didn't get the schooling that i got because they had to do distance learning mm -hmm. they didn't have the parties that i had we talked about being a deadhead <clears throat> i had some fun <laughs> and i think at that age if you if you're not able to have fun if everything is so serious wrapped around death and uh, and plus i'm not really connecting into who i am and having experiences well, I can understand why there's a whole lot of mental health issues. Anyway, there's also been in the intervening period between the first edition and this edition, 300 books, new books that came out with the word empathy in the title. So this all led me to feel very strongly that something is happening, something is needed to be happening. Mm. And not only did I update the book relative to the idea of encoding empathy into business and AI, I also really wanted to lean into the story of mental health and see what's going on in society and how AI could possibly be a solution rather than a problem. Mm, interesting. Yeah, because like sort of going back to sort of like chat GPT, like because, okay, look, this time last year, I had no idea about chat GPT. I would say- Basically, nobody did, very yeah. few people. And now, like, okay, 3.5, which all of a sudden just rose its head, which we're now on 4.0. Like, 3.5, everyone was like, oh, my God, did you see what it's done? Oh, my God, it's doing this. It's, oh, my God, it's doing that. And now 4.0, where it's like, going, ah, it can replace lawyers. It can replace this. It can replace that. And lots of white-collar jobs are being affected, whereas I thought, yeah, I feel so intelligent, blue-collar jobs, not the case. What ha like what would you say has significantly like has there been a significant change in your mindset from when you did the first edition of the book to the second edition of the book? And did something really take you by surprise, would you say? Well, probably to expose my ignorance, I, I didn't anticipate how the AI was going to evolve. I, mm. I I didn't understand any of that. I wasn't enough in the in the works to see exactly what was going on. What certainly changed my understanding of AI was once I started getting into researching for the second edition, I was like, oh my God, that's what's happening. That's how this chat GPT is working or you know any of these other 
large language models, mm. what actually went on. And that just became so fascinating to have my head underneath the hood, seeing why and how we've got to such a step change in AI. And the second thing for sure was that between 2018 and this book, the pandemic and, and how that also affected our relationship with work. Mm. It was already happening before. And I talked about that, of course, in the first book about how people were looking for more meaningfulness, how uh, work conditions were still sort of old fashioned. There was command and control. There was a, a lack of, of um, energy and engagement in the workforce. Mm. And then through the pandemic, the number of people, starting with the older people who had been brought up to say, well, I just work because that's what I got to do. Even they were asking, huh, why am I bothering busting my butt working for these people who are making money for those people? Where am I in that? What, what's it giving me? I mean, of course, it's giving me a salary, roof over the head, food on the plate. But beyond that, and so as a result, you saw all the people saying, well, hmm, great reset. Let me think about what I'm doing. Maybe I can find another job where I find more meaningfulness. Maybe it doesn't even mean getting better paid, but it feels better for me. And that putting the why into why we work has become super important. Mm. And so that pandemic movement, they had the mental health story. You had the idea of, of wanting to work for something more meaningful. And you've also got the whole notion of now flex work or working from home which while in the pandemic was a an imperative you had to in certain industries and such now it's a choice mm. and choice is complicated to navigate yeah um, mm. indeed indeed no like because this is the thing with regards to the sort of like when it comes to the realm of work i think with regards to the pandemic it affected groups of people in fundamentally different ways like sure. i like i've spoken to people who've basically been in the corporate world and i've spoken to people which have been more in the uh service driven like when i mean service proper like yeah doctors nurses like military and when there is that sort of drive that sort of group purpose behind what they're doing they seem to have it much more together and there isn't that sort of realm of, how can I say, uh, existential crisis, if you get what I mean, mm, I do. Uh, in comparison to corporate people, uh, where it's like, nah, you know? Yeah, well, they, they, I think that's exactly the right term. They feel their existence is needed mm. because they are doing something that is of national importance, of monumental importance, as opposed to just going to the hospital and fixing someone's toenail that's in in bed in you know there's there's a sort of mundanity to a doctor's life and then all of a sudden it becomes the focal point of every article in every newspaper there's clapping out the windows and and sort of like when you go to war if you're in the military you that's what you're trained to do you you kick into the mode of this is what I'm doing I'm of service I swore allegiance and I got to do it afterwards when they're you come back from war yes when you come back from the high tension where you have your whole body thrown into the situation there's a big letdown and and you've seen amongst other things of course strikes yes by the people working in the hospital area you've got people who are suffering from less happiness at work even in the medical sphere i've seen it happening the, you know the psychologists who are depressed i mean anyway so um yeah it's uh Within, I, I also think there are other populations that have were hit differently, harder. For example, we we don't tend to talk about the 250 million people in the world that went into extreme uh, poverty as a result of the lockdowns. Mm. So we we saved some lives, perhaps, uh, and I would say perhaps, uh, and we caused a lot of heartache. And a lot of issues. And I think when you when the when you we let the dust settle and look at the actual cost of what happened, there's there's going to be a lot, hopefully a lot more candid uh, reservation. Mm, yeah, like this is the thing with regards to the sort of lockdown and the sort of different realms of trauma what came out of that, like emotional, economical, and just basically social connection, uh, which mm. many people, how can I say, uh 
let's just say social connection was heading in the realm of being quite tough anyway for many totally. people just from their working day just from the nature of their jobs just from where they might be just living in the world you know like if you're doing a 40 hour week going out trying to survive your rent's going up your mortgage is going up you can't really afford to do that so you might be isolated and the lockdowns pushed it beyond that like with regards to finances you might be like people were living on the edge and now that's pushed them further cost of living as well that's even pushed them further still so it's just trauma after trauma and then basically yeah that trauma has built up so much from what I can see. I don't know where it's going, how it's going to manifest in the future, uh, be it positive, be it negative, what we might learn from it or what we might not learn from it. But it's there's going to be decades of study on this, I swear. There is. I, you know, I, I certainly... I'm with you in understanding how many more people are suffering. Mm. So what I try to do within that stance is think about what we can do to compensate or to alleviate. If you're in a situation when you're down, when you're feeling like you don't have social connections enough because you can't afford to go out to the pub anymore because the mm. pint is just too much relative to the other needs you have. So what what should we be doing to to keep it going, keep the flame going? And uh, my, my general response to that is to, first of all, spend a little bit more time since you have that time mm -hmm. thinking about who you are and what's really important to you. Because I think what we tend to do is only start to do that when we've had real bad thing happen to us. For example, uh, a diagnosis of some sort of very difficult disease yes. or losing someone very close to you. And then all of a sudden these aha, aha, oh shit, actually life is short uh -huh. moment. But better to have that idea earlier than before the event happens. And so while this is not a life threatening per se a situation, it's a hardship, mm. it's a good time to start thinking about what's more important to you because once you get that fixed in your mind then you can start focusing the the little time that you have the little extra money that you have towards that activity and when you do that activity then it brings you back some sense of accomplishment some sense of fulfillment and some energy and and that is what's ultimately going to get us through the difficulties that we have today mm -hmm. yeah my that, my difficulty with that what you just said is that sometimes I think the vast majority of people, because they're not doing that type of work, because they're not getting involved in that side of things, they lack the faith or belief in oneself to sort of like, oh, yeah, I can be that bit better. I can move the needle in a direction I want to move it into rather than what's dictated to me by life and society. If, uh, Parents. Yeah, well, parent it parents like so like social groups or just like yeah they are like they focus so much on what the razzle dazzle the show reels they often see thinking that's that should be for me when honestly if they did sit down and go right you see this big ceo and you say that's for me but you might need to be like a farmer or like you know what i mean just like a gardener totally. or like something completely different but they're not doing that, if you get what I mean. I completely get what you mean. So much so, Mua, mm. that my uh, I'm writing a new book for next year. Oh. And the this this is the central topic of this book. And and just to give you one's insight, uh when you when you say, Oh, that CEO, well, if you actually chat with a number of these CEOs, their level of loneliness, unhappiness. And general lack of fulfillment is is absolutely vast. And uh, there's on top of that, you now have all the stress of performing with higher inflation. And while I'm not asking people to bring out the tissues and and cry for them, the the act, even just aiming to be the CEO is some big lure 
because it's not an attractive place uh, right now. The pressures, the loneliness, the mental health issues, and the number of older men who are in big positions like that, who then have this midlife crisis, it's absolutely stark raving normal. Mm. <laughs> stark raving normal. That is, <laughs> no, that is... <laughs> No, oh, start raving normal. No, but like, yeah, I get you. I get you. Because like, this is the thing. I think a number of people are like going, I want control. But when it comes down to it, you kind of got to look at it in the sense of like, there's a like a famous story where this like businessman comes to this like, like fishing village and like he sees this fisherman and he like goes, yeah. And he starts explaining, giving him this business plan. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, you know what? You need to get more boats and you can like, yeah, get more people. And then, you know what? When you've built this like magnificent empire, you can then spend time with your family and sit back and yeah, enjoy your life. And the fisherman turns to him and goes, yeah, but you know what? Uh, yeah, but I get to spend time with my family and like, yeah, I enjoy my life. Uh, and so you're like going right now. And this was I like, oh, I just sometimes don't, yeah, people don't get it, and I don't think they know. Well, for sure, they don't honestly know what they want. And with regards to our crazy, like analog social media world we live in, um, eh, like you know, what I mean, I, I swear to God, I would have like me if this came out when I was a teenager, I would have fallen. I would have fallen for it, hook, line, and sinker. Uh, it's like, of course. it's like so powerful, you know. Yeah, the, the adrenaline kick, the dopamine kick when you get the likes. And yeah. I don't, the, the nature of this book is, of course, uh, the, the title I've given it, or at least uh, the working title, I bought the URL, um, is called The Avatar Trap. And in this, you've got the this notion of the, the digital presence, mm. which we can manicure because it's just a an avatar of who we are. So it's a metaphor at some level for the for this creation of an image of who we are, a re-presentation of us that typically makes us look better, that mm. typically is uh, not in, entirely truthful. And and the gap between that avatar and who you are is, is in my uh, hypothesis, actually creating the, the mental health disorder. Mm. Some, you know, let's say there's bipolar, schizophrenia, as true true pathologies but essentially when you are living another life you know at some level we're always living another life right yes we are it's a case of you if you don't have the sort of checkpoints or the people around you to sort of like uh okay that's not you yeah or this can be you and like it's trust me getting the right people around you is a very difficult thing to do because you kind of like uh, okay um as you like said earlier like parents because like yes ideally you want the best for your child but that means trying to keep them as away from as much risk and quote-unquote danger where like if you looked at yourself when you were a kid you're like going woo. Yeah, you like wild thing. You would have done wild things, but you don't want them to do the wild things, so you restrict them in some ways, like subconsciously or consciously. Yeah, and that, I think we've gotten a little bit off the the right path in this matter. Mm. Yeah, what would like, with regards to the right path? How do you like? How do you see the path? Because you know everyone sees the path in a slightly different way. No doubt. And to use a term, it's not black or white. It's a nuanced story. Mm. And there, there, if I put it in this context. Yes. Virtually all of the, the things that we're seeing in society came from good intentions. Mm. I'm even going to say democracy came with this good intention, which the people votes people in. Mm hmm. And then what happens is that the the politician says, "Well, I'll be a politician, and well, in order in order to get voted in, I'm going to promise eighty things, eighty percent." And then, well, I look at you, eighty. I've got eighty-two. 
Mm. Oh, okay. Then they go for runoff and probably 82 wins because the population says, well, you're going to give me 82. The other guy's going to give me 80. Mm. Well, we're now at a point where politician A says, I'm going to give you 160%. And then the other politician says, well, I'll give you 170%. Mm. And it turns out that anything over 100 is not going to happen in any way. As a politician, you don't even know what enough of what you're talking about in order to put it into place because you have to do things like compromises, get revoted in at midterms, and the chances of you getting 50 right uh, are already difficult. So we in it just I take democracy as an example, but for example, civil liberties. You know, there's we 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 wanted to in, in expand civil liberties because once as I I had on my podcast. A chap called Leonidas Johnson. I don't know if you've ever cross, come across his name. Oh, no, no, I have not. But So he, he does a podcast called Informed Dissent. And uh, he just wrote a book called Raising Victims. He, he's a, a most interesting man. And um, he, he uses a metaphor that I'm going to attribute to him. But I think he borrowed it from some other storyteller of the past, which is about the slaying of dragons. So... This one chap who became really good at slaying dragons, he became known for the slayer of dragons. He became so good, in fact, that he slayed all the dragons. Then the next morning when he woke up and there were no more dragons, he's like, well, shit, my life's over. My existence no longer has purpose. Mm. He says, well, I'll have to invent some other dragons. And so he goes and finds an alternative that he also labels as dragons and goes and slays them. Mm. And little by little, he starts having to invent new things to slay. So the, the initial dragon might have been a good thing to slay, but as you move along and try to improve, like democracy or like other of these types of issues, you end up having to chase a new dragon. And once you fix that, quote unquote, we move on to the next one. Mm. And we've gotten to a point where we're trying to fix everything all the time, everywhere, and be beautiful to everyone everywhere around the world all the time. Mm. Yeah, no, but this is the thing with regards to some, like, some things in society where people sort of champion this, champion that. Yeah. Um, and like, this is the thing. There are going to be some like issues which were valid a few years ago, like really, 100%. really valid, which really. you have been fixed, but they like, you know, like have been fixed. And the people who've been championing this know they've been fixed. And they've like, um, oh, crap. I no longer have a job. Oh, crap. I no longer have a purpose. Oh, crap. Uh, what do I do? And they, uh, well, same thing with the dragons, but like the whole thing is they're cleverer than this knight. They go into a realm where, okay, you never will find peace. You will never find a realm of compromise because if you did... I honestly, like, maybe I'm not enlightened. Maybe I'm not educated enough to see how that would perfectly work, being this imperfect being I am. Look. Amen. Me too. Yeah. yeah. But there is no sort of, like, if you're talking about fairness, <laughs> there are some uh, certain things which will never be fair. And you kind of like go, oh, okay, and we'll go into this, crazy realm of not just crazy but dangerous as well and you know i'm not going to go into any sort of key specifics or anything like this because i'm hey. with you <laughs> so, yeah and, then, and i agree and i agree with you i want to call that world the world of perfectionism the world of infinity and immortality and uh let's say that those ideas whether it's perfection or immortality are a little bit difficult to achieve. No, put it this way. If you if we could achieve perfection in this world, yeah, God. Like, you know what? Look, anyone, yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what that would look like. Um, there was a TV show called The Good Place. I don't know if you've watched it. No, never saw it. Like it's like it's a, it's a very clever comedy, but like, yeah, but it dealing with heaven, hell, everything like this. And with regards to the sort of realm of when they finally got to sort of what heaven was like, 
And it was this perfect, like, it was just like, right. Everyone became so sort of neutered. It was just like, yeah, no sort of drive, no sort of purpose, no sort of thing to like, oh, let me, like, let me enjoy this afterlife. It was just, yeah, all the way through. Uh, perfection doesn't exist for a reason. And if you wait around for perfection, you will be waiting for a very long time. You look back in hindsight and go, was that a per my perfect moment? It was a very close to being perfect, but it was not perfect. And anyone who lives for that is just Perfection is the ally of procrastination. So it's your excuse to never get anything done, you know? I do. And I so agree with you. I, I was commenting on an article the other day written by um, a chap I've come to appreciate. His name is Scott Sandland. He runs mm -hmm. a um, uh, an AI for good because his AI is trying to help with mental health online and specifically anti-suicide. Mm. And um, anyway, he, he wrote uh, an article which really bro brought down some of these like good concepts that we had in the in the past. Yes. Um, and one of them is um, convenience. Uh, it's really great. You know, you have this convenience. All you, all you got to do is now you, you to call your Uber, you go on your app and you can call it from my desk right here, right now. I don't even need to go to the street and hail a ca taxi. And there's a convenience of, uh, oh, uh, you can buy books on a, a little site that comes from Seattle and, you know, the book comes to you and, oh, that's so convenient. Well, if I, if, if, if you go to the extreme extreme, we just sit in our beds and do F all, right? And that's probably not the best thing for our body. So we've taken something that's, there's a, there's a geniality. I mean, I, I'm, I'm thankful we have cars instead of buggies and, and, and horse carriages, uh, and and everything is just moving towards this convenienceization of life. There's uh, two other tracks that he talks about, but I take that one to show as a good idea. Yeah, it's good in parts, but let's not go overboard. Yeah, no, but this is the thing. Yes, technology investments are good. Look, put it this way. Look, uh, just, just look at it from the realm of infant mortality. You go back 100 years. Oh, my God. Yeah, no. look. If if you weren't pumping out at least five or six kids, like you you had in your mind that you you had to basically be like, yeah, you are going to lose half of those kids, and most probably, yeah, the mother who's like producing those kids along the way. It common fact today, you can have one kid. Like you know, no, trust me, I will not go into the details of my sort of birth experience let's just say like while my lady was like experienced with an epidural and gas in here uh so it was like going like yeah quite like like this flowery experience uh, i got it in full hd and like, <laughs> i'll never forget it but the circumstances and everything like that the dangers from childbirth have been for the large large part mitigated you know it takes a real real extreme thing to happen and that's good but i think when it comes to convenience as you say when we get too convenient too comfortable we're not actually challenging ourselves mentally physically or like basically there is not an epic hero journey but that sort of micro hero journey in achieving something or just getting something I fear we don't have a lot of value for anything anymore because of the convenience and the ease where everything comes to us these days. And like, I'll, like you could say, the developed world, developing world. But yeah, that's the way I see it. I might be wrong. You, look, people can disagree with me, but that's the way I see it at this present time. You know. Well, I encourage everyone to who disagrees to to ante up. And, and because in the end of the day, the other thing which I am writing about now, in my, my, the book that will be after this one, is about the value of strong, meaningful conversations. And one of the things we're missing in, in our lives, as I observe it overall, is it's easy to talk when you and I agree. It's very easy. Yes. As I absolutely 100% agree, 100% agree with you in what you just said. And uh, but what what's more challenging in life? If I didn't agree with you, would I have the courage to say, "Hey, I'm on. I'm a guest on your show." Would I have the courage to push back or demonstrate the ability with civility to disagree and and have that conversation? And that is not happening. We get into our little eco bubbles. Oh yeah, 
is 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 she safe? Can I talk to her about this? Or, you know, whatever. And and then, oh yes, okay. Whew. Then once you're in the bubble together, you're dancing, it's fun, you're chatting, you're you're zigging and zagging, and you've got your stuff going, but your mojo's sort of aligned. The challenge we have in society today is we've got bubbles forming all over the place that look at each other and say, Ooh, do they believe the same things I believe? Mm. And, and if and you get into the bigger bubble, let's call it social media or the media. Well, there's only one line of narrative possible. Oh, I hear you. I hear you. And I, this is the thing. Like two, like two things come to mind. When you say civility, that is the key word, civility. Like Because the discussions, like, <laughs> like the manosphere, red pill world, and like, yeah, ultra feminine. No. <laughs> it's like, basically... The discussions are happening, but it's no, there is no manner of civility and there's no like sort of anyone really trying to work it out or trying to build in some sort of realm of progress for everyone. Like, like this is a like this is a bad like argument we've got here. You've got a bad argument. Now let's find a way to the best uh realm or like let's find a way to the best place by having these discussions and getting, like, you know, through the process of the evolution of that conversation, the bad ones die, the good ones thrive and take us to a new place. No. But with regards to the groups and sort of like, yeah, one line thought which is going on in a number of sort of like influential sectors, AI, now, one of the things which, with regards to chat GPT, going back to that, okay, now, there, there was a documentary called Coded Bias, right? Where, okay, yes, it didn't, like, compute, like, because of Silicon Valley and the way it works and stuff like this, like, cameras didn't pick up black people or it compared black people to, and, like, yeah, men, women, like, across the whole thing, there was this realm of bias which lived in a lot of the sort of algorithm code which there is. Now, AI and the realms of chat GPT, which are, we let's just say they're at their infancy and they're only going to get stronger, better, faster, stronger uh, to a terrifying level. There is, there is some form of bias in there at this present time. And to like that is for me a little bit concerning because you're not going to get the best answer, or it's going to take everyone down a certain path, uh, kicking and screaming. There's not a lot we're going to do about it. What have you seen? So definitely, I've seen bias, uh, yeah. but I, I have news uh, that I've also seen bias outside of AI. And to the extent these are man-made objects built on man-made data mm -hmm. that uh, basically is scraped from wherever there's digital footprints, it's pretty unlikely that we are going to, as a race, uh, get to a very fair and unbiased world. There's, I think, in, in the human condition, one, the nature of our lives is to deal with the challenges that are thrown at us mm. and to remove all challenge to remove all risk and make it safe is is not interesting to me and i feel that it's not uh, interesting for life i there's a se se sentence that i i like to say i sort of throw it out there occasionally which is adventure does not exist without risk a life without adventure is not a real life so for me we need to understand that life is about challenges and risk and adventure and if you don't go into or seek out some element of adventure whether it's a micro like you said before a micro adventure micro heroic uh, event or or bigger then it, it it's something which is going to dull you down and the second thing about bias is that it's it's actually I, I I would believe, although I don't have the you know the, the exact neurons that show it, 
that it's a survival instinct. You you, you form biases, and for example, um, no no malintent meant, but I'm going to say my family's more important than yours. How dare you! How? Okay. I'm a crazy man. I'm a crazy man. Watch out. You know, and, and so that's a bias. Mm. I prefer my family, my daughter to your Molly. You know, and I'm sure Molly's wonderful and lovely, you know, obviously, but th this is how we are. And, you know, I, I prefer my football team over your football team. Isn't that a bias? I, it is. And like, this is the thing. The one thing of individual bias, even like group bias, national bias, you kind of go, right, that's one thing. But when you're talking about, okay, uh, automated bias, which works 24 seven, relentlessly, doesn't need to sleep, doesn't need to stop, it just keeps coming. They're like, I don't know what the sort of true effects would be of that, but if you're kind of like looking at sort of mm -hmm, the impact and I'm not good, let, let's step away from bias at this moment in time, but the sort of impact it's made on academic studies and how like they are reacting to like people's coursework being handed in essays, new research and stuff like this. It's, it's one hell of a rock to throw into the sort of pond of things It's causing great ripples. And I can only see that as, Oh, if that's the ripples which are being created right now at its infancy, ooh, I'm not saying this to be like a fear mongering, but yeah, what will be the sort of impact five years from now? Look, forget 10 years, five years, maybe two years from now, you know? How could, like, how are you seeing this at this present time? Mm. All right. So, great points. And I certainly don't have a clear view into the future. My my viewpoint is starting with how you see humanity will inform how you see anything going on. Mm. And so back to my initial point about being aware of who you are, the more aware of how you are, the more you can, let's say, manage the way you deal with something like fear. Mm -hmm. Because in today's world, we have created... A, a, a fear-led society, in part because of all the mania and the craziness, in part by the the ability for social media to now put the words into hands into anybody's hands, as opposed to just the three television stations that you and I were brought up on, and um, and as a result, it's easy to be fearful. They're, basically, that's what sells in media. So I, 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 I wish to encourage people to feel more about who they are, to understand their filters and perspectives, or at least as an individual of yourself, and then allow that to be brought into the equation as you look at something like an AI. So uh, to, to another type of saying I, I tend to like to spill out is that we, as a society, have chosen and desire to hold AI and psychedelics to a higher standard than we hold ourselves to. And I find great hypocrisy in this matter. Let's just focus on psychedelics and I'll get back to AI. So psychedelics, there's been a lot of research that's showing that psychedelics has a high degree of efficacy and remanence, in other words, long-term benefit on a number of pathologies. There are four that generally are being researched at the likes of Harvard, uh, Yale, uh, Imperial, um, Johns Hopkins in America, Stanford, uh, in many places, uh, including in England and Bristol and so on. Mm -hmm. And they are showing that they have way better health benefits or you know, curing of pathologies than any pharmaceutical drug is. And, and yet what we do is we say, oh, look, don't you remember that there was, a, I remember an article about four years ago about somebody who jumped off a bridge and they had had LSD. So a quick attribution, and we forget to look at the fact that the individual might've had some other type of issues. And I mean, I, so this is being abstract, but generally speaking, we're gonna say, well, because of that one issue, we're gonna put 
in the can or the garbage or, or poo-poo the 63% efficacy to combat depression, anxiety, PTSD, or there are, of course, different numbers, but high degrees of efficacy against some significant pathologies that last, if done under good control, and so, of course, it's not about throwing out LSD into the world and having everyone drink <laughs> it like Kool-Aid. So I'm moderated in this purport, but I, I just say that we hold, we want to push psychedelics to be better than pharmaceutical drugs, which where there's the business model, they sometimes have efficacy rates of six, 12%, with an enormous list of second secondary effects, but because they have a business model, they get approved. This seems very hypocritical. And if we go back to AI, uh, one of the areas that I'm really interested in is how we can create therapeutic AI. Mm. And you can't just create therapeutic AI out of nowhere. So you have to have li these large language models start to learn how to understand human beings. And while most of the research, a lot of the data that's online, that's available in order to be farmed and create, you know, analyzed for these AI machines to, to work, that comes from people who have access to internet. So by nature, this is there's an elitism, even though let's say probably 60% of the world has access to the internet, but we've just discarded 40%. And then within the 60%, the majority of the material, let's face it, it's typically coming from Anglo-Saxons. And uh, of course, there's a huge Chinese piece, but Anglo-Saxons, something like 80% of, of uh, research is done on the weird population. That stands for white, uh, economically advanced, uh, industrial, R&D, I can't remember, but, but you get the gist. It's sort of like a, a small group yeah. of privileged people, that, all the weird. And um, and so AI, therapeutic AI, just to finish on that, is the, is an effort by a number of really cool startups to understand better the human being, create dialogue, listen to individuals who have mental health issues mm. at all times, everywhere. And this in a context where country after country, UK, France, Australia, Canada, United States, to the ones that I've studied, have an enormous dearth of psycho psychologists and psychiatrists. So we don't have, we can't make up psychologists. They got to be attracted to the industry, get trained, and even they are not perfect. So what I'm fascinated by and encouraged to talk about is how imperfect though it might be, mm. therapeutic AI is going to be, will be, in my opinion, a tremendous benefit for society because at 2 a.m. not everybody's prepared to take your call when you are in deep distress the ai will be there ability to listen ability to give you some feedback eventually when it's trained and the way it's going to get trained is through the things that are happening like chat gpt mm. Mm. Because like this is the thing, with regards to these large language models, with regards to therapy and everything like this, as you said, like, yes, it's going to cater to the weird crowd, like, first and foremost. Now, Absolutely. yeah. Now, this sort of, like, okay, what, say, someone who lives in, like, the, uh, let's go with Chicago, like, Lo lives in like the a well-to-do suburbs in Chicago, like yes, where it's quite safe and everything like this. But the the sort of other side of the coin with Chicago, it has the highest birth rate the, in the America. South Side. Yeah, yes. has the highest murder rate in the whole of America. It like summer is in Chicago. Wild. So if you took two people from like di like those two different places. Like as effective as the modeling might be, how like will it kind of like lean to more like, hey, you just need to like work less or stuff like this? When like, yeah, it's like I don't know this person living in the south side is like, I'm just trying to survive, you know? Right. Well, you're right, of course. And in my in in my last book, I I talk about the the non therapeutic solutions because I mean, let's face it even a psychologist that is well-versed in the gang violence or whatever else that they're living through in, in South side of Chicago mm. or wherever for that matter, 
um, they they can only provide so much safety or so much counsel, right? What we need to be thinking about also is about how our society is evolving, which is why I'm writing about the avatar trap. I mean, we which is not just about sort of you know social media and mental health issues. It's really regarding how we are bringing our society up, mm. and in each country, different context. You know, I just had a, um, a fascinating conversation with an evangelical minister. So not at all what I, I I'm non-religious. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm really uh, atheistic. However, yeah. the conversation with him was was interesting because we're talking about a religion that generally in America supports the carrying of arms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that's a conversation that needs to be had. But it, right now, it's an existential conversation for most people in America, as in either you're in the camp, well, guns kill people, or you're in the camp that it's people that kill people, and it's not the guns that are at fault. Uh, well, you, well, it is people what kill people. But like, you know, uh, if you're giving them the means and tools to have access to kill people more efficiently, uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you kind of got to watch that. But yeah. No, but um, like America for me, with regards to the argument with gun laws and like yeah, preserving life, uh, from conception to it, it's it's very weird because it's like right, and it's not just whites. Huh? Oh it's no, not, no, you know, no, in the in the weird, in the weird, the word, yeah. you know, the word weird. I was just saying before, yeah, it's not just yeah. not the white weirds. It's everybody yeah. fucking. I mean, weird. I'm talking about the like I'm talking about the whole sort of American like. Yeah, totally. In total, it's kind of weird because like they'll like they'll fight and fight and fight for not aborting a life or anything like this, but we'll fight and fight and fight to keep guns in play, which therefore and like all the news reports. I'm going from news reports that come out of America, people. So yeah, don't get mad. You see mass shootings in schools and everything like this. So it's like you want like okay. So you want to raise this child to come to a certain point in time, and then if they're gunned down, you're okay with that. I don't understand it. It confuses me at times. Well, let me um, bring to your attention, Mira, the so the man I was talking about is a guy called yeah. Robert Shank, Reverend Robert Shank. He, I, I call him a dear friend. We've had many, not heated, but certainly strong conversations together. Mm. And... Um, he uh, he he actually changed shirts as we say i suppose where he remaining an evangelical minister he decided that it was not compatible to be pro life and pro killing at the same time like just as you said mm -hmm. right you know the idea of guns and so he decided to go back to his his congregation and say you know listen to this idea of guns not so hot and you can imagine that a population, his his congregation, all bearing arms, doesn't think that was particularly good. Anyway, there's a film that was done by him, uh, done by a woman called Abigail Disney, the granddaughter of Walt, oh. and that that film is called The Armor of Light, and it and it shows it's a documentary that shows his voyage from being an evangelical minister pro life pro guns to an evangelical minister pro pro life against guns, and and the consequences to his life. Uh, which were very nearly severe mm -hmm. as a result. Anyway, it's a very brave decision that he took. And uh, it it um, it shows that we need to be having more ability to have more civil debate around and understanding the other perspectives more than just brushing them aside like, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah, but this is the whole thing, but this whole realm of empathy uh, comes into, whole, uh, into play in a major way. Um, like as much as like as like as much as we live in civilized times, and um, fast forward that twenty years from now, we will be heathens and cavemen. Uh, it's like uh, the sort of realm of empathy, I think, has it's non-existent. In, like in certain realms, and um, when I say this in certain realms, I would say that in sort of intellectual groups are basically uh, thought leaders which like much of society turn to there is like no sort of empathy there is no sort of like yeah let me have a look through other people's eyes to like get that sort of get to the nuance of what might be the, the root cause of our but 
societal problems. Like, yes, we need like more therapies called upon on a daily basis each and every time. But the realm of sort of loneliness and like people like, well, like if you go with men, like going, how many, how many people would you say you've got close friends? And that number has reduced drastically over the course of time. Um, is it a case of people's like nomadic like ability to travel? Is it a case of yeah, people's work habits where they're not actually staying in the workplace? Uh, like for 10, 20 years, so they don't build those sort of like relationships? Or is it just something completely out of left field, which no one's actually like thought of or considered? But <laughs> none of that's happening right now. Now that empathy is right, so two, a couple of things. First of all, uh, the other one, the other issue I think uh, which needs to be put on the table is narcissism, mm. where we and the, and the sort of the egocentrism of, of the world where I am the most important thing. And uh, uh, there, I want to talk about um, another concept I've been writing about, which uh, I'll be elaborating on, of course, which is this notion of self actualization. And uh, this is the point. We 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 the Maslow's theory. We 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 get the basic needs all figured out. Then we have higher and higher needs, and then at the very top we have the self actualization, which means that you know I'm fully fulfilled. But there's a problem here. What we've done is like all of these other things. We've gone a little bit too far. We've focused on the self, mm -hmm. and we've done it so much so that it's no longer actual. It's unrealistic. And we go from self-actualization to self-deification. Make me godlike. And if I can, live forever. And so you have some individuals who are absolutely dead set on killing or getting rid of this bug called aging. And, and that horrible idea that we might die. And, and, and so this, this is a what I would call the, the problem of the world at some level, which is the glorification of the self and the stopping of being actual. So this is our paradox. And I think it's a very sad place to be, which has led to all sorts of issues, including attaching ourselves to causes, like you were saying before, that are so big that I, I won't be able to fix them, which means that I'm destined to fail. I'm destined not to achieve the fulfillment of satisfying massive issue X, y or z like for example trying to get rid of all bias it's just not going to happen i'm trying to get rid of all wars it's just not going to happen trying to get rid of all starvation all inequalities all unfairness it does does that mean we shouldn't continue to fight for some of it but let's not seek perfection in it and in in uh in what you were just talking about where we we, we tend to try to push for the best possible world, you know, the the hundred percent version of AI, the hundred percent version of an an equitable world, and when whenever we try to push for that, where it's truly not within our a capability, and two, in my opinion, nature as part of the human condition, we're destined to create worse situation. Like. Mm. Indeed. No, because like, this is a thing. I think a lot of this stems from, really stems from, like, yeah, the bonds and friendships we are missing like, in this day and age. Like, because, like, look, don't get me, like, don't get me wrong. Like, yeah, being able to sit down and just chat shit with a friend. Okay, look, because people are like, yeah, you need therapy. You need therapy. You Yes, you might need therapy, but yeah, like for example, they were like there were these three dads who were walking up and down the country, like because their daughters committed suicide, right? I think with that bond, that connection, these three guys did with that long walk, like I can't remember how long it was. I think they went the length of the UK. That long walk, they got a hell of a, a lot more out of that bond and that friendship than a million, a billion hours of therapy would have given them. And yeah. I, yeah. And I think with regards to the sort of connections people are really lacking. 
they're missing that. And I think when it comes to like ladies are better than guys at doing that sort of, okay, I'm going to have this chat. I'm going to have that, you know, you know I'm going to connect here. We're going to meet up. Look, like, yeah, my, like I've, shit, I won't lie. Some of my friends with like, if the, if my lady make born builds a connection with their lady, it's like, I'm like the amount of times I'm seeing them goes up exponentially. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if if you left me to my own devices, like in my like in my life, I'm like, look, I've got a a big room, I've got a TV over there, computer over there, squat rack behind me with an exercise bike. I'm good. <laughs> it's like you're a pig and shit. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm good. Like you know what I mean? But that like they have that ability which i think mm. guys sometimes struggle with and when mm. like, and a number of times yeah the societal push is like you need to just go to therapy no 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 you need to find a group of like guys who either gone through similar shit as you have so you can have those conversations where yeah you like you might be doing something superficial or something like this, but the conversation will come up, which will help heal along that way. I don't think therapy is necessarily the best way. I don't think some ladies might fall into the same sort of category as well, but I think men need to be doing something together with a group of guys who are either similarly in that same boat, so they've got that sort of common drive of purpose. And that's why I think a lot more guys do better if they are serving in some sort of organization where they've got a greater common drive for that sort of common purpose. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. It's called, um, well, being of service to a larger community mm. and in the military, the benefit is on top of that. It provides some structure and discipline. It gives you an idea of what leadership looks like. It mm. may not be the only one, but by the way, I mean, I, I talked to uh, my friend, Michael Ventura, he he did a lot of work with the the uh, the officer uh, training camp in the United States called um, West Point, yeah. and they they have specifically looked at in great in including empathy as a talent as a skill amongst the the core the cadre of officers not just because it's better for leadership mm -hmm. but also war today as it turns out is much more about being embedded in foreign communities. And, and knowing how to, with someone who's veiled, uh, talk to them without thinking, oh, well, this is some, some just, just some kind of Muslim. Mm. And, and, and finding ways to relate into them and teach them the skills of empathy, even in the military. So uh, just uh, following on your, on your rant about how we, we men, I think generally speaking, I agree with you that we men are poor at that. Mm. We have other, other skills, but we've created a society where we're privileging uh, because of society's pressures, safety. And um, my son, he went to university in America and uh, taking another risky topic, me too, um, absolutely necessary, right? There's a lot of, there was, uh, continues to be a lot of bad situations mm -hmm. where men are taking advantage of women in the worst cases. Yes. The result was at the university that my son attended that two of his friends were were kicked out because a, a, a woman in each case uh, anonymously tipped that this person had taken advantage of her because she had a beer in her hand. And while I don't know the specifics, the consequence of that was that all the boys that surrounded my son were no longer interested in talking to a girl with a beer because... Yeah. So no. we've got, we've created, so of course, you know, there's nuance to what I'm saying. Hopefully people understand that violence and taking advantage and all that is completely unacceptable. However, we've gone to this point where we're into this sort of polyethylene, super superficial manner of existing, and we're not allowed to embrace one another. We're not allowed to touch one another. There's a great book that I'm just about to um, finish called, um, how We Touch by Michael Banasi from um, Bristol University. And uh, he talks about the, the need for us to touch, but we've so cleaned up our act, you know, quote unquote, that we're not allowed to kiss or embrace or shake hands because that's dangerous. <laughs> you know what? Like, geez, if 
Uh, there are some times where it seems like, yes, uh, back in 2020 when we were all locked away, like, yeah. Um, have we truly come out of lockdown or is it like manifested in some weird new way, you know? Well, I see people still wearing masks. I see people still being hesitant to kiss because that's not uh, that's that's not healthy. And I, when I say kiss, it's sort of more the French style. I'm not talking about French kissing either. French style, yeah. <laughs> kiss on cheeks, right? Easy. Or the Russian style, which is <laughs> lip to lip, right? Um, with men as well. Uh, but Michael Banasi in his book talks about how uh, it turns out that people who hug, people that kiss like that, uh, are become more immune to issues. They, they, there's a transmission of bugs and issues that our body then tolerates and figures out how to deal with. If we so sanitize everything, our lives in general, from any risk, whether it's playing in the street, where there's a risk that a car might come, there's playing in the street where they might fall and scuff their knee, playing in a rugby match where they might get a concussion, playing, doing anything that involves any degree of risk, well, we're creating a society that A, is not going to not deal well when, not if, the shit happens. And two, uh, is going to create a non-resilient group that will seek therapy rather than deal with life. And like you say, go out and put your hands in the mud, go on a thousand mile walk, or you know, even just go out and walk, smell the air, get rid of technologies, hold hands, put your hands in the dirt as you're seeing, of course, in a, in a in an appropriate manner but put your hands in the dirt and enjoy the feeling of earth in your fingers and underneath your nails and don't say oh my god my nails are dirty mm. yeah one of the things which like uh, with regards to ai and the whole sort of like a sanitized world because like in some regards like yeah chat gpt is not so much creating but scraping and then sort of like you know they piecing together how like if no one's creating anything new or original and everything like this, how like how long before you ask like if you do the same parameters, like from two different places, you might put in a slightly different thing that will spit out the same kind of answer or the same kind of essay or whatnot. How like if you get what I mean? It's I do. Yeah, that's going to come to one sort of polarizing point of create like quote unquote creativity or like yeah well i i think actually the the bigger risk within that is the singularity of narrative as if there's only one answer to everything and or there's the right answer and then everything else is wrong mm. and as we as we try to eliminate biases and eliminate any danger from anything that comes out of it there's a there's a big chance that it just becomes l less efficient less effective Mm. And uh, but I think that my approach is not to not try to get rid of biases. Mm -hmm. of, I, I you know it's like nuance within this, but I think that the bigger issue we should be looking at is how can we, as human beings, improve? Let's not focus on the negative critique of ChatGPT and AI. Mm -hmm. What about just let's have the conversation about us? Mm -hmm. And and we don't have enough about that. It's it's very simple. We like to blame politicians for all of our ills, be the victims of all the problems like Leonidas Johnson talks about. Well, let's go back and be a little bit more proactive. For example, you know, my book is nominally about inserting empathy into AI. Mm -hmm. And and one of the things that I find fascinating about the research and, and the writing of it was how trying to encode empathy into AI provides a tremendous mirror on ourselves. It, 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 it forces us to understand when you try to put ones and zeros into it, what actually is empathy? And, and then the second question is, why are you putting empathy into AI? Is it because you are so empathic that you want the, the AI to mirror your empathy? Or is it you're actually asking it to do the empathy because you can't be bothered to do it yourself? In which case, if you don't have a fully empathic set of people that have a broad understanding of the different circumstances, for example, the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. then it's very likely that you're just going to continue on the same path of, as we are. 
So I think it's a great opportunity for us to step back, think more about ourselves. I'm not in favor of stopping the progress of AI. I think that the, the chances of us coming up with a regulation and legislation that's going to make it better uh, all long term are unlikely. Because if you take out the commercial element of it and you just allow bureaucrats and civil servants to run AI, which is what the, uh, the idea behind the regulation would be, it's unlikely to provide the creativity that you were just talking about. I think that if we don't have ambition, if we are only all seeking good, the idea of creativity tends to fly out the window because the best poets, the best songwriters, they, they, and life mm. is about dealing with bad, leaving, dealing with difficulty, hardship, heartache. If you've gone through life and you, you know, and you've never had a breakup that created all sorts of angst, you have never faced uh, an F because my parents negotiated for every one time I got a bad grade to get a better grade. <laughs> what sort of a preparation for life is that? Well, no, it's no preparation whatsoever. It's <laughs> um, like basically, well, it's all it is, is just delaying hardship, uh, honestly, uh, because like this is the thing and the hardship might be quite mild, but, you know, like, well, compared to other people, because we are. <laughs> mm. Yeah, a big broken finger. Oh, my God. Look at that. It's calamitous. <laughs> yeah my life is over yeah but like people take that and go yeah isn't it so goddamn awful and like you can go to another place in the world it's like and yeah this person had most of their family massacred and they managed to just escape by the skin of their teeth by walking like across a desert this that the other and like you know what i mean and uh, to find themselves in this place today <laughs> it i just i think people yeah need to work on yeah, that sort of resilience, that sort of, like, yeah, that when, like, controlled hardships, because when they do come, and it's not, like, no one lives a perfect life, no one lives a life of complete serenity. If they did, well, I don't know what type of person that would be. Uh, very sheltered, molly coddled, and no one's act, like, no one around them is telling them the truth. So, Amen. <laughs> so you know, that's not a good place to be. But if you're not doing that on a regular basis, not sort of like, yeah, okay, life it like pushing yourself, pushing yourself, you're not you're not actually making yourself stronger. All you're doing is just making yourself weaker and ultimately, yeah, you will be a victim of life in some form or way. I'm not too sure what that how that'll manifest and how they will overcome that. And if they don't, they will be left by the wayside, um, physically, emotionally. Um, yeah, to like some greater like level of where the only realm is total despair and the only way out is a very dark yeah. place indeed, you know? Uh, so I, here's the, I, my feeling we need to say at this point, what one must do is live our lives fully day in and day out. <laughs> mm. Ah, oh, I like that. My soul plugged it. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Thank you very much. But yeah. <laughs> Woo. My, my. That, very, very. I, I love talking to you, my friend. I love talking. It's to you. fun. You know, I really, I enjoy it because we obviously come from different backgrounds and I feel like we've come to the same conclusions. It's one of those things where I, I, I think we, it's very easy to just sort of sit back and like look at point one or point two, like and go, that is that is the truth. That is that is reality. You and, and nothing else matters. But the whole thing is, it's a lot more complicated than that. And like, yeah, when you don't show the realm of common sense in like basically like no like not even knowing yourself, just like for if you look at it from a business standpoint. Knowing who your customer is, uh, knowing who your true customer is, but light. All I'm going to say, <laughs> I like that going, right, okay, this is our customer, this is what, and this is how they see things, or like, yeah, how they interact with the world. And then like, throwing something which out there, which is 
not so abhorrent, but like kind of like, yeah, a big F you to who they are or who they like, or not, not even who they want to be, but you kind of like go, right. You're not, there is no empathy there. There is no sort of like, yeah, taking on board, you know? If I can push back just a little bit, the, the notion of being customer centric, a great idea. But I think the harder job is actually internal, starting with yourself. Because mm. until you have come to a kind of equilibrium about yourself, it's hard for you to have the, the stance, the vision of who anyone else is. And if you're worried about the chip on your shoulder, the zit yeah. on your nose, then you are inevitably filtered in the way you observe anything. And if you really want to be a good company or, or, you know, do well with regard to your customers, the people who are interacting with your customers are your employees. Mm. And, and the more you're able to lean in with them and create an empathic bond within, the more likely you're going to have an empathic relationship with your customers and get to know them better. So I feel that the real, the real work, the harder work is actually within and until you do that, the rest is cosmetic because you're really not in a sound enough place to listen with neutrality, without ego in, in the way. And, and that should start with you, your closest people, your family, then your employees, your distributors, your, your third party vendors, whoever those are, and then your customers, because these are the people that are transmitting your brand in a business environment mm -hmm. and so in the first place and and life is short so if 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 you want to have a good life make sure that you are you at home in the shower in the bed in the dining room table with your friends on the way to work with the bus driver at work with your colleagues dealing with your supplier who's not giving you the price you want all the way down to the customer who's buying your product. Mm. And, and, and I'm not asking at all to be perfect or totally good in this because none of us is perfect. We all have naughty sides. We all have less good sides. Let's embrace those. Doesn't mean that we're gonna accept that we're horrible people. We can always improve, but let's not strive for perfection or eliminate all badness because mm. that is the human condition. We are imperfect beings, embrace that element understand how everybody's a little imperfect, including yourself. And as soon as you start accepting that, by the way, that we also are mortal, then things, but you become more grateful uh, in, in every day and you become more reasonable when you're approaching other people. And I think that's how we need to fix the world. No, no, I agree. And like, yeah, like, no, the reason why I say I agree is because I like, Throwing back my mind to like when Apple was going through, like, okay, let's just say, uh, not the sort of behemoth they are today, but the sort of like when like Steve Jobs came back, identity crisis, Apple, desperate Apple, like a billion one different products, which made not a lot of Apple sense if you kind of looked at it. He like came in. Was I wait a second? No, 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 stop this, stop that. Look, you like love Steve Jobs, hate Steve Jobs. Like, yeah, you might think he is the best thing since sliced toast, uh, like sliced bread, excuse me, or you might think he's an absolute ass. Like, uh, yeah, the truth like le lives within many different spheres, but he actually understood what the sort of authentic truth of what Apple was. And like, yes, he went, yeah, this is what it's about, this is who we are, and yes it started the like direct moving in the right direction yes new mac came out yes like pretty much after that yes new like tablet came out then it was like yeah moving 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 and yes came to the iphone and it was like boom next level and then it just kept on that way and heimer bush on the other hand I I don't I think they've got this realm they've had this crisis going on and they forgot who what their authentic self is I don't know if it's been lost in some form of corporate manifesto many moons ago 
or they just like right so like it's like why well, they do a knee-jerk reaction which they did and look i have nothing against dylan movini of whatnot like you do you you go out there and stuff like this there'll be plenty of other people who will but when like the per- person who was like ah this should be our spokesperson i don't think that person ever had a bud light i don't think that person ever had a conversation with a true bud light co- like customer or if they did they like they saw themselves so above them looking down upon them it was like they would never make that connection uh empathy no elitism possibly on um, the highest order and look and i think no like you asking me to sell beer to look if it was like to some frat boy and yeah you might say this might be sexist or anything like this like yeah show me a bunch of guys having a good time with like yeah ladies in bikinis in the background you have got yourself a customer right there come for me if you want but yuck that's what would sell bud light that's what i'm going to say you know yeah <laughs> it's not that we, complicated <laughs> so. no. well i mean we we are making it supremely complicated mm. and and as the, the way forward though is not to be black and white in our in our discourse because there's there's good things and bad things and frat boys there are bad things that happen and yes, and I so let's, let's moderate you know how we haze the new ones and you know maybe there's I, i'm not against hazing at least in, in the realm of making initiation uh like when you join a tribe and and you have to do something difficult i think that's good you know the the closer that is mm. or the strength of that adventure or risk helps to bond you know, like the bond, a band of brothers in war. So uh, I, I'm not suggesting we need to do something that's all the way up to death, but we've 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 now got to a point where filing your nails together. Uh. <laughs> uh, that does that slightly disgust you a little bit? <laughs> does it? <laughs> I I I I um. I shake my eyes, I shake my head, I I wonder. But anyway, that's why I am uh, really on my little war path to try to bring back these conversations in a way which isn't designed to rebut all elements with some element of nuance. We should be allowing ourselves to have more conversations. and And somehow we need to have these conversations in a wider audience because right now the narrative, the media, continues on this path of whitewashing, rendering sanitized all of our conversations where that's this is the one way to go. The only way is forward. And it's all supposed to be under the banner of progress. And at one point, when when this progress gets to uh, living forever in a completely risk-free world where everybody is supposed to love everybody all the time, everywhere, we we will have lost the plot and something else much bigger is going to happen so yes uh but this way let's hope that something bigger uh, is uh, way off in the horizon but mm, <laughs> i won't lie <laughs> yeah, there's been moments like yeah squeaky bum time i think is like yeah definitely in the air say no more <laughs> nudge nudge wink wink Mm, then, mm, yes huh. yes <laughs> let's not go too far east <laughs> that's a, that's what i'm gonna say now now with regards to your podcast you're on you're currently on episodes 517 or is it 590 somewhere in there uh, i think um i can't remember 500 and anyway near, near over 500 for sure and um, I've, with my French one, I'm now proud to say I'm over 600 and no, 700, 700 podcasts. So moving along, keeping on the old podcast trail. Yeah. OK. Now I have to ask what like, OK, you've when Yes. The, these conversations are important. And everything like this. Now, from someone who it, like for anyone out there who might be fresh to podcasting, like what like. What kept you going to do like yeah, thirteen hundred plus podcasts? 
like on a regular basis. Like, yeah, in English and in French, because ooh, like there are people out there who are, I want to do podcasting. It's like, great. Five episodes in, I'm not doing podcasting anymore. But yeah, Ew. yeah. What motivation could you use, like, or sort of little nugget of drive can you offer these people out there? Well, um, everything I am choosing to do. I, I I feel like I've and then my own inner narrative is that it's linked to who I want to be as a person, and so doing and being. But uh, I've started off with figuring out what I wanted to be as a person, and when I do my podcast, generally speaking, uh, a large percentage, ninety some percent, have written a book. So this means that I have to read the book, and reading I read about two books a week. And reading is a tremendous way to stay young, to stay curious, and to learn other people's perspectives. I'm always trying to find people who have differing perspectives. Sometimes let's call it a minority perspective. It doesn't necessarily mean they are minorities, but the, there's a minority perspective in that. And I find that very enthralling for me to have on my show, um, I can have a, an atheist and I can have an evangelical minister. I can have somebody who believes this and somebody who believes that. And, and that for me is is truly ener energizing uh, for me. So that's really the inner force that in the, the meetings you have when you hit the re record button, I'm sure you would agree, 306 episodes in, um, that record button has something delicious around how it changes the, the nature of our conversations. Having conversations in general, it's enlivening, it's social relationships, it's it's engaging in something that hopefully at some level is important. The error that I did at the beginning was I kind of was a little bit all over the place in terms of the podcast. It was back in 2010 when I launched. Mm -hmm. I since then refined more and more who I'm looking after, looking for, and I've gotten more, let's say, professional or at least more efficient in how I do it. So it doesn't take up as much time. There is a whole lot of baggage in, in figuring out how to do it, the systems, as you know. But once you... Once you know why you're doing it, it's far more interesting at a deeper level, why you're doing it. If I'm doing it just to have vanity metrics, if I'm doing this just to make more money, well, that's fine, except it's probably not going to be a long-term driver. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, no, trust me. I, this podcast game isn't easy. <laughs> money? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> my lady sometimes looks at me and goes mm. <laughs> you keep on doing what you're doing but mm. <laughs> well, I, I i hope that it, it contributes to your charming smile that that strong laugh that you just had i'm hoping that that also brings back some flavor of appreciation from your missus oh well I'll put it this way uh it's it's helped keep me it's helped it's helped keep blah, blah, blah. it's keeping me alert it's keeping me i would say young at heart uh or young intellectually being able to move uh, more fluidly rather than sort of getting more ingrained in stone with regards to where my thoughts and yeah where my learnings take me thankfully i've had a very diverse group of people on this podcast i could have niched down uh, to like, yes, I'm going to just speak to these people. And like, yes, it'd be the podcast would be vastly more successful, but I would be richer on one hand, but a lot poorer on the other. But much yeah. somehow. But yes, thankfully, I've had the joy and privilege to meet people like yourself. I've had to join people like me in like such a group of people like yes living lifestyles some i i wouldn't like take on but like living lifestyles which you know what i mean get them through life and like yes and insight on that yeah much richer much richer <laughs> yeah i i you know what i don't know if i have any more questions to ask you sir I, well that I must say this just as well because i have to go and pretend like i'm a young boy and go out and play my paddle tennis so Ooh. I have a match to go to go sweat, do my version of what you do with your workout. Uh, oh, oh, indeed, indeed. Oh, yeah. Like, you know what? I'm sure you're going to have a fantastic time uh, doing what you do. But yeah, Minta, can you let the lovely people out there 
know how they can find you out on these interwebs. Well, I, I am on the interwebs. Uh, my my existence tends to be circulating around my, my own website, minterdial.com. I've got a few socials, mostly under the M dial, which stands for Mundial in Spanish for short, but it's M-D-I-A-L on Instagram and Twitter. And, and otherwise, my podcast is called Minter Dialogue. And my new book, uh, which just released, is on Amazon and now on about 15 other platforms as an ebook and a paperback. And um, it's artificial empathy. And if anyone knows Substack, um, I'm doing a Substack. I've been talking about conversation for 70 weeks now. Oh. And it's called minter.substack.com. So if any of those are of interest to you, go check them out. Uh, I'm happy to to uh, hear what your feedback is because I, I do enjoy the conversation even if you disagree with me. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Ah, Minter, thank you for coming on today. You have been sensational. Always a joy. Always a pleasure. I look forward to your return. Hurrah. <laughs> thank you. And I look forward to meeting you in person. We have to make that happen, right? Oh, yes, indeed we will. Uh, indeed we will. We'll talk about this just after this. <laughs> But yeah, let me just say thank you to you, my friends, my life warriors, for sticking with us to the end of the show. Please uh, stay well, stay safe, be awesome, be excellent, be fantastic. Be all the positive bees you can be in this world and then some. Have a great one, guys. Peace. And we are...